Hi everyone, welcome to module two, CO2 response curves. Today we're gonna to be talking about the method that is widely used in order to measure CO2 response curves, and then we'll discover all the biological information that we can get from them. Back in module one, I asked you to think about how photosynthesis can change as we see an increase in CO2 availability. And if you were like me, then you might've thought that the relationship would look something like this. But this relationship is not possible at all, and today we'll talk about why that is and how we can measure it. You can measure photosynthetic response to rising CO2 levels by using a Lycor 6400, which is a portable photosynthesis system. This happens to be my favorite piece of equipment. It's high-end, which means it's very expensive, but it does a fantastic job of allowing you to control many different types of variables. And in this case, we wanna make sure the plant has plenty of light, that the temperature is set not too high and not too low, and that the relative humidity remains fairly low as well. Once you have all the environmental parameters set up, the only thing you wanna change would be the CO2 concentration. And we just need to make sure that the concentrations vary from zero all the way up to something ridiculously high, such as 2,000 parts per million. And just as a frame of reference, ambient CO2 concentration is somewhere around 410. I've used this method hundreds of times in the field. The only kind of hiccup that you can have using this method would be, can you in fact reach the leaf that you want to reach? And how much time do you have? In order to implement a CO2 response curve, it takes anywhere from 45 minutes to 90 minutes. And so while this method gives you incredible data, it's very difficult to get really high number of samples throughout the day. So let's go over what a typical CO2 response curve should look like. Just to point out on the x-axis that we have internal CO2 concentration, which is essentially the amount that is available to the plant. So we should see that increase all the way from zero up to 2000. And on the y-axis, we have net carbon assimilation rate. This basically means we're thinking about the balance between how much carbon is being released via respiration, which we haven't really talked about yet, but right now we're focusing on how much CO2 gets fixed as it goes inside the plant. So the plant needs to kind of balance CO2 going out and CO2 going in, and that is what is represented in the y-axis. In module one, we talked about the importance of RUBP, Rubisco, and CO2 molecules in the carboxylation phase of the Calvin cycle. So now we can see how these three limit photosynthesis in the form of this graph. So for the first part of the graph, we're going to see a very steep and linear increase in net carbon assimilation rate as we see an increase in internal CO2 concentration. So why is this happening? Well, these values tend to be below what is normally found in leaves, meaning that for this range of internal CO2 concentrations, that means likely the stomatal pores aren't open or that there's some sort of limitation to, of diffusion of CO2 going inside the leaf. So for this portion of the graph, the leaf is in fact limited by CO2 concentration. It's kind of starving for it. It also means that there is plenty of RUBP present. And the problem is, since we don't have much CO2 going in, that RUBP is in fact searching for that partner of a CO2 molecule. So RUBP is very saturated in this region of the graph. This region of the graph is also called carboxylation efficiency. So why is that? It's because the slope is proportional to the maximum activity of the enzyme Rubisco. And as you can imagine in this region, we are limited in CO2, but we have plenty of RUBP. Uh, therefore, we don't have much activity going on with Rubisco. I also wanna point out a part of the graph that might be slightly unusual, meaning that we have this dashed line here. At, it's a horizontal line at zero net carbon assimilation rate. And if we go to this point right here, basically we are talking about something called the CO2 compensation point. 
This basically means at this exact point here that respiration and photosynthesis balance each other. And once the curve gets above this dashed line, it means that there is more photosynthesis happening than respiration. Thus, we tend to get this positive value in our net carbon assimilation rate. So let's add in the rest of the graph. So for the second part of the graph, we are going to see something happening like this. So rather than keep on continuing with photosynthetic rate, we're going to see something that tapers off like this. So essentially, the plant has reached some sort of maximum point in how much photosynthesis it can possibly achieve. So what is happening in this region? In this part of the graph, we actually have too much CO2. So in this region of the graph, we call this CO2 saturated. And this is the exact opposite of what we saw in the linear portion of the graph. So now what's happening is that we are limited by RUBP, meaning that we can't get enough RUBP that gets regenerated from the Calvin cycle. And concurrently, with the light reactions, they simply can't keep up with the amount of ATP that needs to be produced in order to maximize the use of such high CO2 levels. So this is what your curve should generally look like for any plant that you are measuring. And if your graph does not look like this or your data points don't line up on a curve like this, that means something's gone wrong. Either it's human error or maybe the plant didn't acclimate enough to some of your environmental settings. That does happen. But in general, your curve should look like this. I also want to point out that I drew a standard curve. There is no set point where we should only see this linear portion and therefore that is it. Meaning that it could be short. It could be something that only is linear from zero to 200. And therefore we see a tapering off and a line that maximizes there. So that can be different. The steepness of the curve or the steepness of the linear portion um, could be really different in between individuals as well. Where we achieve this maximum net carbon assimilation rate. That can vary. It can be much higher or it could be much lower. So I just want to point out that this is the standard curve that you should get. Um, and it's the interesting parts come in when these curves are compared to other curves. So let's make a comparison now. Let's pretend we have a plant that has been grown with plenty of water and plenty of nutrients, and we took the Lycor 6400 and performed a CO2 response curve. I would expect the graph to look something like this, where it has a nice linear portion. And then, of course, it tapers off here once it can't maximize anymore. So this is what I would expect for a pretty happy plant. So now what if we make the comparison to a plant that has been grown in an environment that is kind of low on water and fairly low on nutrients. So take a moment here, press pause, and just draw the graph out for yourself in making your comparison to a pretty stressed out plant. What does that curve look like when compared to the pink line shown here for a plant grown environment where that is pretty great? So take a moment to press pause now. Well, I would expect the linear portion of the graph to look different. I would expect it to be shorter and the slope to be less steep. So this would mean its carboxylation efficiency isn't that great. Um, it's even more limited by CO2 and more saturated by RUBP than when compared to the happy plant. And what about the taper off? So I would expect it to also taper off much earlier in terms of the CO2 values and have a very minimal or much lower maximum photosynthetic rate and overall net carbon assimilation rate compared to a happy plant. And so when we look at data sets from across the world, people that use the Lycor 6400 to measure CO2 response curves, this is what we see. And so overall, you can make these really great comparisons between what biochemically is limiting between two different types of species or two different types of you know, groups of plants exposed to different environmental treatments.
That's it for CO2 response curves. Your takeaway should be how to use the Lycor 6400 to get accurate CO2 response curves, as well as all the biological information that can be extracted from the different portions of the CO2 response curve.